worship your holy name. And Father, we thank you we can do that because we're not consumed as we come into your presence because of the blood of Jesus. And Lord, those of us who know you, your Bible tells us that he who knew no sin, you made him to be sin, that we can become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And Lord, we thank you for the access that gives us right into your presence. Not only to worship you as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, but to know you as Father God, Abba, Daddy. And so, Father, we thank you for the security that comes from knowing you, from being in you, from having you as our beloved Heavenly Father. Lord, may each one of us sense your presence this morning. In a world that seems to have gone crazy, may we sense the security, the anchor of the Father in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may take uh, your seat. Let's show our appreciation to the team again. I'm doing my impression this morning. I'm a little horse. Horse. So, okay, please yourself. Uh, maybe we can have some lights on. Thank you. Uh, if uh, this morning you're here with a toddler or a baby that needs fed. The baby room is to my left and your right, and then the toddler room is on uh, beyond there. Uh, the kids are going out with Lorraine this morning and uh, her little helpers, and the older youth are going out with Chad, so have a good time out there. I always just like to make just double check that there's no adults slipping out there. I know Rachel's not very tall, but allegedly she's an adult. Somebody told, adult, uh, somebody told Rachel last week that I give her a hard time. You should see the hard time she gives me. It's just sowing and reaping. Anyway. If you've been with us a while, you'll know we've been doing a series and uh, we've been on prayer recently. <clears throat> and I'm sort of taking a little twist without changing the theme. I'm staying on the theme, but I'm taking a little bit of a, a twist this morning. And this is at Mary's suggestion. So if you don't like today's message, see Mary afterwards. It's nothing to do with me. But I have been asked to speak on Wednesday at uh, the Platin Jubilee service uh, that the council are holding for the Queen's uh, Platinum Jubilee. So some of you who are here this morning may hear it again on Wednesday, but it will be slightly different, so don't panic. But I just felt as I looked at this, there's so many similarities as I looked at my message for Wednesday and then looked at us um, as God's people, because you know what the Bible says? You see, some of us are brought up in a... In a in a background where the monarchy is something to be looked up to. Some of us were brought up in a background where it was something to be disdained. But in kingdom culture, the Bible says that we are a kingdom of kings and priests. Did you know you were a king and a priest unto God? That's what the Bible says. Some of you knew, some of you didn't. The Bible says we're a royal priesthood. So have you been brought up in a culture that doesn't like royalty and you're now a Christian, you better get some twisted thinking straightened out. Doesn't mean this is not a political message, but I just want us to get some biblical kingdom principles in place because sometimes we're directed and, and journey through our future because of what's happened behind us. Whereas we have to get kingdom culture, what does the Bible say? So anyway, that's just as a, as a little aside. And so we'll get to that in a moment or two. So we've been looking at the Lord's Prayer. We haven't got very far, as is usual, with when I start a series. And we've looked at this first little bit, our beloved Father dwelling in the heavenly realms. May the glory of your name be the center on which our lives turn manifest your kingdom realm cause your every purpose to be fulfilled on earth and that's 
as far as we've got so far. We saw that Jesus begins with establishing our spiritual identity and roots. Just go on to the next one. In the heavenly Father. He says, our beloved Father dwelling in the heavenly realms. God's not just the creator of the universes. He's our heavenly Father. Corporately. He's my heavenly Father. He's your heavenly Father. He's our heavenly Father. Uh, and so we looked at that. We saw that Jesus went on to tell us our big why. John Heenan always talks about, what's your big why? Why are you on earth? Why do you exist? Most people, you say to them, what's your big why? They'll look at you, duh, what do you even mean? But why, why do we exist? Why are we on this earth? Why are we on this planet? Jesus gives us the answer. May the glory of your name be the center on which our lives turn. Turn. When I was a little boy, we were brought up with the catechism. Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's actually what this is saying. Everything about our lives, the center of our lives, should be in relation to God's glory being manifest through our lives. It's a big challenge, isn't it? Followed by praying for the unfolding of every, if his every purpose on earth, manifest your kingdom realm, cause your every purpose to be fulfilled on earth. Sometimes we think that's out there, but actually when you pray that prayer, if you pray it genuinely, you're asking God to do that through you. You're asking God to manifest his kingdom through your life and through your actions and reactions. We looked at kingdom protocols. I've talked to a lot of people recently about Christianity, and, and they said, well, I, you know, I think there's a whole lot of ways to God to believe in ultimate reconciliation, believe every, there's a wee bit of right in every group. Jesus didn't, Jesus is very exclusive. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so Jesus said this, but seek first, uh, but first and most importantly, seek after, uh, aim at, strive after his kingdom and his righteousness, his way of doing and being right. So Jesus has a way of doing and being right. Anything outside of that, Jesus said, Any, anybody who tries to come into the sheep pen any other way is a thief and a robber. So you can have all, we can have all our great views and ideas about things, but if it's not Jesus' way of doing and being right, as far as God's concerned, you're a thief and a robber. You might be sitting beside a thief and a robber this morning. Watch your handbag. Hope you have those zippy pockets. Make sure you have no loose change. And then we looked at the, this group of people who were seeking and aiming and striving after to find God's will for their lives. We finished off sir, on this little bit last time, Acts 13. I love this passage. Better start my timer. Okay, Rachel. Safe enough. Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, etc., etc., etc. As they ministered to the Lord or as they sought the Lord, the Old Testament uses this phrase a lot, David sought the Lord. David was seeking after the Lord. That's what they were doing here. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul, who became Paul, for the work to which I have called them. The voice says it this way, commission Barnabas and Saul to a project I have called them to accomplish. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. Love this phrase in the voice. Commission Barnabas and Saul to a project I have called them to accomplish. And we finish by asking the question last week, who or what is the project that God has called you to accomplish? Because each one of us are on this earth for a purpose. Each one of us have a project. Some are grandiose and get us on a world, get people on a world stage. Others are quietly happening in the background. But people are, are those cogs that are making the world turn. And they're still fulfilling God's project in their life. So I thought this morning my subtitle is called to accomplish. The word accomplish is to successfully complete something to finish something. And so we're called to be accomplishers. We're not called to be failures. We're not called to get the job half done. We're not called to do a bit and then say stuff that. We're called to complete the task before us. And so the queen is someone, no matter what we think of her, whose whole life has been an example of this Acts 
13 principle. You have to admire somebody that's held down the same job for 70 years. I've had people work for me that haven't lasted seven minutes. I have walked, and we had the coffee shop open here. Hope you weren't one of the staff that got the sack. But anyway, I would have walked from the coffee shop door to the church, which is probably 12 paces. And maybe a new person, because my background is hospitality. I have walked 12 paces and then come in here and said to Mary, that person's not going to do. Mary said, what do you mean? Should they only start at five minutes? I said, "They they don't have it. They don't have the ability to work in hospitality. They're not going to work out. So you, you, you couldn't tell that from a 12-minute walk by. I said, well, you wait and see. Because I've had 30 years of experience of knowing just the shape people stand, how they hold themselves. You should see how I'm analyzing you lot up here. <laughs> and so the queen has held down the same job for 70 years. Quite interesting. The queen, it's the queen's platinum Jubilee, 70 years. And how did you jump from that to that? Oh, I tell you, if you're a preacher, you can do a whole lot of things. Do you realize that the day you were born, you signed up for a platinum plan? The man from the Peru was at your house. <laughs> no, he wasn't. Anybody know who the man from the Peru is? Maybe some of you are too young. Prudential Insurance. All these insurance companies have all these, a gold plan and a silver plan and a bronze plan. But if you really want the big payout, you need a platinum plan. All right? Uh, But you had a platinum plan. Look what the Bible says. Psalm 90, verse 10. This is written by Moses. The days of our years are three score years and ten. For those of you who are not used with the old money, a score is 20. The three score is 60 and 10 is, is 10, which is 70. So Moses is saying the days of our years are 70 years, platinum plan. And if by reason of strength they may be 80 years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow for the soon cut off and we fly away. He'd be some cracking awake, wouldn't they? Unbelievable. At least enjoy the, the 70 or 80 years you have. Don't make it into a whole misery gut thing. I'm going to ask this question on Tuesday night for those of you who come. You know what age Moses died at? 120. He's going to get our lives cut off between 70 and 80, this skitter. I'm going to, I would, you know, they say when you get to heaven, you're going, you have questions you want to ask. I'm going to ask Moses, what was that all about? Everybody's thinking, oh, eight, 70, going to be dead, eight, I'm going to be dead. He lived another 40 years, sold as a, a pup. Anyway, and maybe I read the Bible differently from everybody else. Why 70? 70 is interesting. Uh, scholars, people who are much smarter than I am, tell us this 70. A lot of things to do with 70 in the scriptures. The, the Jewish nation was established, the Bible says, with 70 souls. Didn't realize this till I studied that yesterday. Perfection, 70 is to do with perfection and completeness. Perfection of creation, seven days, including a day of rest. Completeness of the law, the Ten Commandments. And so that's why 70 in Bible numbers is, a, is an important number. And so... 70 is the days of, if anybody's 70, Isabel, you've reached perfection and hopefully not full completeness, but uh, at the end of the day, it's a good number then, isn't it? And so, I don't know, happy birthday anyway, whenever that was. So the queen has not only lived three score years and ten, she has walked out the project she was called and commissioned to accomplish Quite amazing. Just reading some articles on the Queen over the past couple of days. It says, since 2000, since the year 2000, when the world has been going very anti-Christian, her Christmas message has been centrally about Jesus Christ and her relationship with Jesus Christ. When everything else was going AWOL, she was coming back to the main thing and pointing us to the main thing. And I remember saying to Mary over the past years, the queen is really, she's a real evangelist. She's really given it the, the welly here to, 
nailing our colors to the mask, telling people, I love Jesus. I follow the teachings of Christ. He's my Lord, et cetera, et cetera. If you listen to the Christmas messages, it's quite amazing. And I read an article which said from 2000, the year 2000, there was a big change in her messages, whether that was on purpose, whether she just felt, hold on, the world's going mad and I need to take a stand. I don't know. But uh, the Queen has a very clear testimony of following Jesus. And of course, she has walked that out, but we all have an individual project and plan. So we can't say, that, well, that's okay for the queen. I'm not the queen or the king. I'm just an ordinary person. We all have a project and a plan that God's, God has for us. So I'm going to look at some principles. And so whether this is to do with the queen or to do with you, the, the principles can apply to all of us. Being prepared. You know, sometimes people say, well, I never get the opportunity. I don't know what uh, my project is. Maybe you're in the preparation stages. Maybe you're being prepared for what your project is. And projects can come in seasons. We talked about this on Tuesday night. Sometimes you have a project for a season, and then there's another project God has for you if you're faithful in that one. But preparation is an important thing. I remember often saying to Mary, Lindsay has far too many jobs. You know, people don't want people that jump from one job to the other. She had seven or eight jobs in a, I don't know how many years. She's out. She's probably watching the next door. So so we can talk about her then. But the irony was when we look back now, every one of those jobs were preparation for what she's doing now. The project, what she's found to be the calling and the project of her life Every one of those jobs was a preparation. Every one of those things was a training. So don't despise the day of small things. Don't despise the day of preparation. Don't think, oh, panic, panic, panic. I don't know what I'm called to do. I don't know what my project is. Maybe God is preparing you for that time when he's going to reveal that to you more clearly. And so from birth, Princess Elizabeth was being prepared for the role of monarch. She probably didn't think she was going to take on that role as quickly as she did, but she was being prepared for the role. She was ready when the time came. This is not anybody you know, hopefully. But the day of the race is not the day to prepare for the race. Sometimes we are not being shown our project because we're not ready. And if we were handed, if it was handed to us in a plate, it would destroy us because we'd be puffed up. We would be afraid. We would run away from it. There would be all sorts of reasons. But when God has been preparing you, when you've been preparing yourself, when the time comes for your project, for whatever God's wanting you to do, at whatever level, you're ready. Sometimes we just naturally ease into it. We don't actually realize we're doing it, but other people look at us and think, wow, that person's in their element. That person, just by their demeanor, how they serve, how they reach out to people, that's what God created them for. Their project doesn't have a a fancy title, monarch. It's just, you're just Joe or Isabel or Jesse or whoever it happens to be. But you're fulfilling a role that God has placed you in this earth to fulfill. Here's a couple of little things to do with preparation to fulfill God's project uh, for our lives. It's helpful to know what God wants us to do. One of them is being yourself and not trying to be somebody else. Have confirmation from the word, Christian friends, leaders, etc. Pray, be in prayer that God will open doors for you. You don't run away from your project. Pray that God will open the doors. If you feel something in your heart, God's calling you to do something, preparing you for something, ask God to open the doors. Prepare our hearts, minds, and skill set to be ready. You know, some people have a calling on their life, but they don't upgrade their skill set. They don't learn the computer. They don't learn a language. They don't learn whatever the, the thing is that's really going to assist them with their project. They just think, oh, well, if God wants me to do it, he'll anoint me to do it. Well, actually, sometimes we have to do some preparation. Sometimes we have to work. Sometimes we have to learn some stuff that God then can anoint to carry us through to the next stage. 
You'll notice these all begin with P, uh, since we're talking about platinum, my good Presbyterian background. What do you think, Jordan? 100%. Good girl. You have to say that. You're sitting in the front row. Prayer was a big thing when, when uh, the queen was been at her coronation. This was one of the prayers that was prayed over the queen. It says, Eternal God, who at the coronation of Elizabeth, our queen, did set her apart for service. Those are biblical uh, principles, aren't they? Anointing her with the Holy Spirit. If you've ever watched any of those documentaries, Queen Elizabeth really believes she's been called and anointed to do the role. She just It's not just a give us a job. It's, it's an anointing, a calling that she has. Grant, we beseech you, that strengthened by the sevenfold gifts, uh, we may likewise always remain faithful to our calling and active in the service through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so the Archbishop of Canterbury was praying that she's set apart, that she'd be filled with the Spirit. You know, prayer, the Queen probably has had more prayer than anybody else that I know. Uh, and every day, probably 24 hours a day since she's been crowned, there's, this prayer has been sung for her. We don't realize the national anthem is just a prayer with music. Did you know that? Look what it says. God save our gracious queen. Long live our noble queen. God save the queen. Send her victorious, happy, and glorious. Long to reign over us. God save the queen. Well, God has saved the queen. She knows Jesus. She has that personal relationship with him. Has she had long life? She's 96. She's heading up on Moses. When she gets there, she'll be able to say, Moses, I didn't believe that. 80 years crap either. And so, so maybe you're not allowed to say that in church. Uh, but imagine if the queen lived 120. Charles would be scundered, wouldn't he? But that, that, you know. Probably not allowed to say that. Long life, long to reign over us. 70 years, probably the, I think she's, is she the longest living monarch? If not, she must be up there. Then another P, the paraclete. The para what, you said? Paraclete is a word for the, the advocate, the helper, or the Holy Spirit. And so that was, the prayer that was prayed for her, but the queen was anointed with holy anointing oil by the Archbishop of Canterbury. He put a, the sign of a cross in her hands, just above her heart and the crown of her head. I thought that was beautiful. I hadn't realized that. Her hands, her heart, and her head anointed to be the sovereign. See, as God's kings and priests, each one of us, God has anointed our hands to do his work. He has anointed our hearts to keep us pure. He's anointed our heads with the oil of joy and for wisdom. You see, we have every anointing. We talked last week about drawing water from the wells of salvation. God has given us, each one of us, the anointing to do what he's calling us to do. Then she made a pledge and a promise. We're going to talk a little bit more about this on Tuesday night. Are we good at keeping our pledges and our promises or do we think after a while, well, that doesn't mean anything any longer? Once you make a promise, God takes you at your word. And so the queen said this at her coronation, the things which I have here before you promised, I will perform and keep. So help me, God. I've told you this story before. I know this to my cost. Uh, I went on holiday when I was 18 years old with a guy and uh, he was the most annoying guy ever walked in shoe leather. Don't think you're allowed to say that as a pastor either. But anyway, and uh, I got up out of the bed in the morning to go to the bathroom. He had the bed made, five o'clock. I'm on my holidays. He had all the suntan creams lined up, you know, one of those OCD type of people. And by the Wednesday of the holiday, I said to the, lo the Lord, Lord, if you help me not to kill this person in his sleep, I promise to serve you all the days of my life. I'll do anything you ask me to do. And so here I am. Da -da. <laughs> I was a chip man at the time. Didn't think I was going to end up a pastor. 
Anyway, so be careful what you promise uh, because God is going to hold you to your word. We all have a path on our journey in life. Uh, it's a path of responsibility, of diligence, of duty. The queen, I meant to look up how many duties, royal duties, the queen has performed. It must be into the hundreds of thousands. Loneliness. It must be a lonely job being the, the monarch. Not a lot of people you can compare notes with other monarchs. Reward, joy, sorrow. Psalm 119 says this, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn an oath and have confirmed it that I will keep your righteous ordinances, hearing, receiving, loving, and obeying them. Not a tremendous verse. When the queen was being uh, crowned, she was also given a Bible and some words were spoken over her, which very much relate to this. I will keep your righteous ordinances, hearing, receiving, loving, and obeying. Four things to do with the word of God. Do we hear it or do we close our ears? Do we receive it once we hear it? Do we love it? I think, oh, for goodness sake. And do we obey it? Because if we do that, our path will become brighter and brighter as the time goes on. Pain and pleasure. You know, I'm sure, like all of us, the queen has had lots of pain in her life and lots of pleasure. Uh, she, I was watching an article on TV last night. She talk, was it, I can't remember what year it was, but her bum year, her, uh, I always have to be careful how I say this word, her anus horribilis. Uh, and so when the Westminster, uh, wherever it was, burnt, burned down, it was a fire, and I think the three divorces in the family. You know, it doesn't matter where you're, the monarch or Joe Bloggs, stuff happens. I already said something else there. Stuff happens. And so you have to be so uh, careful not to judge what people are going through. Because we all, whether you're the top of the pile or just a ragged or five-eighths, as they used to say, we all have stuff. We all have pain and pleasure in our lives. And here's what Hebrews tells us. Looking away from all that will distract. Because pain and pleasure can distract you, can't it? Pain can distract you from God. But pleasure, you get so caught up in the, the blessings of God that actually can distract you from God, looking away from all that will distract to Jesus, who is the leader and the source of our faith and is also the finisher, bringing it to maturity and per perfection. There's that accomplishment, that completement. He, for the joy of obtaining the prize that was set before him, endured the cross, despising and ignoring the pain and the shame, and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So as we seek to accomplish our projects, each one of us, there will be times of pain, there will be times of pleasure. We need to keep them in balance. We need to keep looking to Jesus on the great days, and we need to keep looking to Jesus on the bad days. The queen has endured, as I've said already, uh, she's endured pain, derived pleasure. I know she loves the Commonwealth. She loves meeting people. Um, I had the joy, as you know, of meeting the Queen, and, and she's a very personable, uh, very just, she just seems to be able to get into your space. It's quite amazing, uh, and I'm sure she's met uh, hundreds of thousands of people, none as interesting as myself, of course, as she said to me. That's a lie. Uh, but we'll all have our own versions of this. We need, if we're going to fulfill our project, patience, persistence, and perseverance. Can you even imagine? Some people start work when they're 32, 30-ish. They go to school, and then they go to university, and then they do a degree, and I think, I'm not really ready for work yet. I'll do another degree. It's nothing to do with what I'm going to do, but sure, I'll put in another three or four years. 
and then I'll take a year off and travel the world. And then well, I'm 30 now, I suppose, I better start a job. And then they get a job somewhere that they, were retire, they can retire when they're 55. 25 years of service. A lot of people, 25 years, that's all they do. Queen's coming up in three times that. That's patience. That's persistence. That's perseverance. That's knowing you're called to a job. That's not just having a job, and I know she's wealthy and all the rest of it, but that's not just having a job to put food on the table. That's just not having a job to get enough money built up for your retirement. That's living the dream. And I uh, told this story before, maybe told it on Tuesday night. Mary and I were at an event where there was probably 30 people there, and uh, there's all these complicated questions you ask you about your life and stuff. I hate that stuff. You had to do role pl play and all this sort of stuff. But they ask us, what would you do if you... There were two strange options. If you knew the Lord was returning this week, or if you won a, a million pounds in the lottery. Now, those are sort of, well, who put those in the same sentence? What would you do? 28 of the people basically told, wrote down that they would tell their boss to stuff his job and they would go and do such and such. Mary was at one end of the room. I was at the other. Mary wrote down, I just keep doing the same thing. I wrote down, I just keep doing the same thing. And so the person who was leading the group said, there's two people in the room, obviously, what they're doing is a calling and something that they were put in this earth to do. The rest of you need to rethink what your jobs and what you're doing. And whether people just said that because it was the, the funny or the cool thing to say, but actually most people, if they had the opportunity, would give up their work tomorrow. Life's too short to be in the wrong job. Life's too short to have the ladder of success leaned against the wrong wall. We need to find what God has put us on this earth to do. And so let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due, the appointed right season, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. And so if we keep doing the right thing, there's a day comes when there's a harvest for doing the right thing. Matthew 24 says, And the love of the great body of people will grow cold because of the multiplied lawlessness and iniquity. But he who endures to the end will be saved. It's about enduring to the end. It's about being consistent, patient, persistent, persevering in what God has called us to, to do. Because if we do, there's a reward, there's a harvest, there's a prize. The queen in her role has obviously had to deal with the protocols. The protocols around the royal family are amazing. Nobody does pomp and circumstance uh, like the, the royal family. Even the Americans have to admit to that. And uh, so when you go to Buckingham Palace, it's just quite amazing all the stuff that goes on. But the Queen in a world where politically, po political correctness has gone mad, uh, the Queen has been able to adapt but keep her values. I'm going to talk more about this on Tuesday night. This should get a bit of crack going. What about you and I? How do we cope in this woke society? don't even know what that word means, but everybody's using it now. When stuff that used to be wrong is now right and stuff that used to be right is now wrong, when everything's so PC and young people are being brought up, bombarded by this stuff, how do we cope? How do we keep true to biblical values in the midst of that environment? And of course, in doing all this for each one of us, as well as the queen, we fulfill our purpose. Just love this line of a, of a song that we sing that we all know so well. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. That's an amazing line. I can't remember the name of this. It's Jesus. You can move the mountains. What's the title? Mighty, Mighty to save. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. How do you know you're giving your life to everything you believe in? 
People say to me, you don't have membership in this church. How do you know your members? It's very, very easy. Three things. Time, treasure, and talent. Say, what do you mean? Well, they're at church. They give of their time. Their talent, they serve. Their treasure is in the house. Their tithe is in the bucket or online or wherever. If those three things don't line up, people are just attenders. They're not members in the biblical sense. And so whatever we're called to do, if you want to know what your project is, look at where your time is. Look at where your treasure is. Look at where your giftings are, your talent. The things you're giving your time, your treasure, and your talent to are generally what God is calling you to do. Well, they could be totally off base. You could be giving yourself to the wrong thing. But the thing you love doing, the thing you feel you're called to do, you'll keep coming back to that. And so if it's, if it's God and his house, those things will make it easy for you to understand. Yes, I am giving my life to follow everything I believe in. Just as we finish, two more things, two more slides. Apostle Paul said this, not that I have already attained or I am perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus also laid hold of me. I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. There's a prize as we fulfill our purpose, as we walk through life fulfilling the project. There's a prize. Ultimately, the prize is to be with Jesus. There's an upward tug. We talked about this. The dead in Christ shall rise first. We're going to be with the Lord. There's an upward tug to the purposes of God. But he says here, I love the, the King James translation. He doesn't say I press towards the prize. I've said this many times before. It's so important. I press towards the goal for the prize. Don't bite off more than you can chew. Begin to ask God what your project is and then begin to say, well, what's the first step I can take? What's the first goal I can have to reach that project or to participate in that project? Don't try to swallow the whole project at once because it could overwhelm you. Begin where you are. Do what God's asking you to do now. Be faithful in what God's asking us to be faithful in now. Walk out what God's calling us to do now. Because he, as, he, as you do, then you'll get the next part of the picture. Press towards the goal for the prize. And so, just as the band come, please. In our platinum lives, are we prepared? Or are we hoping we'll be ready in the day of the race? Do we know or are we seeking God's plan or project for our lives? You don't necessarily need to know it today, but if you're seeking God to find what, out what it is, that's a great help. Are, if, are we following God's path? Are we seeking God in prayer? Are we asking the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, to lead and guide us? Are we following through on our promises? Are we pushing through the pain and enjoying the pleasure? Are we persisting and persevering? Are we true to ourselves and the word uh, of God? Or are we being shaped by the politically correct crowd? A friend of mine said many years ago, I never forgot, the truth is always your friend. Sometimes people don't like to hear the truth. Now we are told in the scriptures uh, that we are to share the truth in love. So remember that little caveat. But the truth is always our friend. Are we fulfilling our purpose? Are we pressing toward the mark for the prize? I pray that we are. Let's stand together as we worship God for in our final song.